Band refused to yield. Right, you guys don't want to stop. That shows your age. Okay. I want to talk to us, I want to talk to you today about being real. Uh, do you present yourself to the world based on who you really are? You know, when we start talking to people and we start using Christian terms or we start using biblical statements, a lot of times they'll say, well, are you a pastor? I guess if you are a pastor, you, you say yes, and they, 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 they forgive you for it. <laughs> but... Okay, you're a pastor? <laughs> right, but we need to speak the language of God. We absolutely have to do it. It has to become a natural flow from us. You know, I wish, uh, well, I grew up as an Orthodox Jew, as most of you know, and I didn't come to the Lord till I was 29, but I'm really envious of the kids, say, in this church and other churches, and, and Mark, who, who teaches them in, in Awana, and they memorize verses. You know, they memorize all these verses, and they don't realize that those verses become part of them, and then when they speak, they naturally say those verses and maybe not even realize it, and that's what we have to do as well. Do your words and actions reflect what you believe and who you are? There's a book, a child's book, maybe you've read it, called The Little Prince. You ever read that book, The Little Prince? It's not really a child's book. And it says, what is essential to life is invisible to the eye, for it is through the heart that one truly sees. And it's easier for us to judge other people than to judge ourselves. We're really good at judging others. But God looks at the heart. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. If we reverse that, it's believe, so confess. We here who are believers, do people know we're believers? Look how Jesus addressed people whose speech didn't reflect their heart. You read in Matthew 23, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. These verses are about men that gave an impression of being good, but on the inside they weren't. I believe we do the opposite. I believe we know the Word of God. I believe we want to live the Word of God, but I believe we're afraid to express the Word of God to others. We say, oh, I don't speak, I don't talk religion. Let me just tell you something. Everything is about God. There is nothing that's off base. You say, well, I don't want to talk about homosexuality. That's about God. I don't want to talk about abortion. That's about God. I don't want to talk about marriage. That's all about God. God invented marriage. You know who you really are. When you turn out the light at night and you're alone with your inner thoughts, you know the, what you're really like. All day long, you present yourself to the world at your job, with your friends, with your family, acquaintances, do they see the real you? Here's the problem and the blessing. The problem and the blessing. God knows you. That's both the problem and the blessing. He sees the innermost man. He sees you. He sees you. I truly believe that if we, the men that are here, go out from here and express ourselves in godly fashions, talking the word of God, speaking the word of God, telling people why we're happy. When someone says, hey, why are you so happy today? Tell them why you're happy. Because he who knew no sin, God, became sin for me, and I have his righteousness, and I'm jumping up and down, and that's why I'm happy. They may not want to hear it, but if it's natural in your speech, and you have the words, and, you're, and, and you tell them, I want to share things with you because of the love that I have, and I want to share the gospel and spend time with you, because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says all good things come from above. The Apostle Paul was brought before the Sanhedrin because of his testimony, and he said, he had fulfilled his conscience before God 
The high priest Ananias gave orders to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said in Acts 23, 3, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, law yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. The question is, is your conscience fulfilled before God? Are you at peace with God, and do you have the peace of God? You can't enjoy God, which is what we're called to do, unless you have the peace of God and the peace with God. You read Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything. About what? About anything. But in every situation, prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Transcends. Your perspective will be different than the rest of the world. We need to act joyous because it's an act no because we are the only ones that should be joyous we know where we're going we're going to spend eternity with god the rest of the world should be depressed and they are the world needs us they need every every man here they need us they yearn for us romans 5 1 therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ we're not at odds with the creator God of the universe who created us. So our conscience is clear before God. We will have peace with God. We'll have the peace of God. Job 22, 21. Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. The world will see this peace and they'll want to be with us. They'll want to know why we have it. They'll, they, they want to be with people that are joyous. We need to express this joy. We need to show it. Before, coming, before the coming Babylonian captivity, false prophets were claiming peace in Jerusalem because they had a wall. And we're talking about a wall now, right, in this country. But it was a false peace. In Ezekiel 13, 15, it says, So I'll pour out my wrath against the wall and against those who covered it with whitewash. I will say to you, the wall is gone, and so are those who whitewash it. That's a false hope that the devil presents before the sinful world in order to lull them to sleep about sin, that they believe it's acceptable. But God looks beyond the superficial. We are very superficial people. We present a veneer of respectability, a facade of decency, a covering of honesty, appearance of dignity. Look at who we respect. Look at who we respect. Entertainers, singers, actors, radio personalities, athletes, politicians, maybe not politicians. <laughs> <laughs> lawyers, you know, well, okay, we're really getting into it now. I'm sorry if there's any lawyers here. The wealthy, this is who we respect. We elect our representatives based on their looks, their hair, their speaking ability, and not content. Our churches are not growing, but our sports facilities are SRO. We're very superficial. We've always been superficial people. Would you elect a man president who was bald, fat, had a lisp, but was the smartest guy around? They, they tried that once. I don't know, you guys are not old enough to know when Adlai Stevenson ran and he, uh, for president, and the thing about him was he was too smart. We don't want to elect this guy. He's too smart. And if you think this is a new thing, you read 1 Samuel 9, which I had you read. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, son of Zeor, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphiel, of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. They elected a tall, young, handsome man. No mention of intelligence or moral character or godliness. He was a disaster, but he was tall. God judges the heart and the mind of a man. Hebrews 4.12 for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. We look to others as if they're whitewashed tombs. They need the word of God, but do we look at ourselves? We were born with Adam's sin nature. 
The Bible says we don't seek after God, no, not one. But God loves us so much, he gives us a new nature to seek after him, to stop being superficial, presenting a pretense of what we really are. We are men of God. I know that. I know most of you. I know what you do. I know what you believe. We need to walk. We need to talk the talk. We already walk the walk. So let's be real. Let's be servants for God. Let's realize it's all about God. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Ecclesiastes. It's really a tough book. It's very unusual. Uh, it's a spirit really of hopeless despair. It has no praise or peace. It seems to promote questionable conduct, yet the words of the preacher are this. It shows us futility and foolishness of a life lived without an eternal perspective. A life lived without God is useless. I, we talked last week about the book of Philemon and Onesimus to be useless. What a terrible thing. The words of the preacher says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity means futility, meaningless, arrogance, useless. We must live with an eternal perspective that changes everything. Why pretend that we're something we're not? God sees and understands it all. Why should we pretend? Okay, so what do we do about all this? How do, how do we change this? I know what we are. We need to show the world who we are. We're men of God. How are we going to do it? In three ways. Number one, our speech. Little things. We say, have a good day. You go to 7-Eleven, you get a cup of coffee, the guy says, have a good day, you say, have a good day. Forget that. We must say, have a blessed day. That's a little thing. It's just a little thing. Try it. I've had people, they kind of look at you. Then the next time you say it, they say, yeah, 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 have a blessed day. Or you say something on the phone, people say, thank you. They want to be able to say what they really feel as well. We need to give them the right to do it. Forget this, have a good day. Have a blessed day. You got to say more, God bless you. Not just when someone sneezes. <laughs> we need to have speech that quotes the Bible without quoting chapter and verse. We don't have to do that. We don't have to show people how much we know. But we need to say the words of the Bible that come, become part of us. Because that's what the world needs. You know, we witness to each other. It's called the holy huddle syndrome. We are all, we all great at witnessing to each other, but do we witness to the rest of the world? And we don't have to make tremendous changes. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying in our speech. First of all, we've got to read the Word of God so we know the Word of God, so we can memorize some of the Word of God, and it can become part of us, and it just flows naturally. You see that in Gus all the time. How many times has Gus said there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus? He loves that verse. It's become part of him. And he says, if I don't have condemnation, he can't give condemnation. I'm saying this for Gus in case he's watching. Anyway. <laughs> People must immediately know we're believers. Will we get it from them? Sometimes we will. They're going to call us fanatics. They're going to say we're fans. We must learn to witness naturally in our daily pattern of speech. Praise God. God bless you. Have a blessed day. Number two, we need to be available. As a doctor, I fill up my schedule. People call and say, I have a sore throat. Oh, I can't see you for three months because I'm all busy. You can't do that. You can't do that. And we can't do that in our lives as well. You cannot do that. You cannot fit everything in your life. After I leave here, I got to go rush to do this. I got to go rush to that. Someone stops me outside. Hey, I have a little problem. You know what we have to do? Let's pray right now. How many times on the radio you hear somebody say, oh, our hearts and prayers go out to them? That's bull. They're not going to remember that tonight. They're not going to do it. Somebody says to you, I have a problem. You need to say to them, let's pray about it right now. Well, well actually, I can't. I got to go somewhere. I got to do this. I got to do. We must have holes in our schedule. We must be available. We must take the time. So we must speak how we feel. And, it must, and, and the Bible must be so in us that we, it just flows out of us and we have to work on that and we have to do that and we have to study it and we have to memorize it. We have to do that so it just comes out but we have to be available. We have to pray for people right on the spot. Try it. When someone says to you they have a problem, say, let's pray about that right now. How long does it take? Two seconds, two minutes. We have to do that. The third thing, we need to have some money put aside. We all live paycheck to paycheck. I don't care if it's five bucks. I don't care if it's 10 bucks. People have a need. We must be able to give money to causes 
that people need. We have to have time available. We have to have our treasure available. We have to have our speech in line with the word of God. People will know that we are believers. I told you the story, somebody came into my office and I was speaking to them and I had known them for 10 years and they was talking to me and I said something about Jesus and they said, I didn't know you were a believer. And that really, that was like a knife in the heart. That was a stab in the heart. That doesn't happen to me anymore. People know that I'm a believer. They have to know that we're believers. I know that we walk the walk. This group walks the walk. So many people go out and do things. We have to talk the talk as well. It's kind of the opposite. We're the opposite of those whitewashed tombs where they look good on the outside, but inside they were dead men's bones. We're not like that. We know God. God knows us. God has invaded our lives. We're living it. And we must show people worth with our words, with our treasure, with our availability. There's another thing. There's another fourth thing. Every one of us needs to disciple someone. Every one of us needs to disciple one person. And every one of us needs to be discipled. You say, well, no, I, I don't need to be discipled. I'm a pastor. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Just because someone's a pastor doesn't, need, doesn't mean they don't need the Word of God and they don't need your availability and they don't need your, your time and your treasure. I never assume pastors, you know, know things that, that, that they're not acting out that I'm not seeing. They're human beings and people as well. We all need to disciple one person. Do you have the time? Are you available? We all need to be discipled by at least one person. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a pastor for, for 30 years. You need to be discipled. Life is too short to fill it with the superficial, time-consuming, useless, unnecessary things. We must represent the living God by living godly lives as men. The world needs us. They yearn for us. One more thing. One more thing. To pull this all off, besides talking the talk, besides being available, besides giving of our treasure, besides discipling someone and being discipled, we need to be clean vessels. We need to be clean vessels. God will not use dirty vessels. We need, to clean, we need to be clean vessels so God can use us. We are a nation of priests. By the way, the Bible says, we're priests. Every one of you is a pastor. Every one of you is a priest. All of us here are pastors to tell people the word. But it must, it must be real. It must be from us. People must know who we are, not by quoting chapter or verse, but the chapter and the verse has to be in us, and it has to flow naturally. And to do that, we got to work at it by reading the Bible and memorizing it and studying it. We have to do that. And then we have to apply it to our lives. I think here we've got the opposite of the rest of the world. The, the rest of the world are whitewashed tombs. The rest of the world looks good on the outside, but inside they're not good. But we have it. We are good inside. We have the Holy Spirit in us. All we have to do is be yielded to that Holy Spirit. And the Bible says all good things come from above, so it's from God anyway. We have to give God the credit. We have to live so people know who we are. It's very important. Anybody have any comments about any of this? I don't usually ask for that, but that's, you know. You what? Yeah, we have to live it. It has to be real. It has to be real at work. It has to be real with our own children. Our, our greatest mission field has to, be, has to be there with our wives. It has to be real. And people will listen when it's real. And people will maybe say you're fanatics, but they'll listen because they want to listen because the world has nothing but they have us. Jesus started with 12 men. Look how many we have here. We can change the whole world. Let's end with a word of prayer. Heavenly